Well, thank you very much. It's nice to see uh, a lot of people out here today. The weather is cold enough for you. I was hoping for rain so I wouldn't have to speak. <laughs> okay, uh, my story starts back in 1940. I wasn't doing that well in school, so I decided to join the Army. So I went down to Philadelphia and I enlisted in the, the Army. And when the man said, uh, you're going to be putting in a signal aircraft warning, I said, what's that? He said, I don't know. <laughs> it's a thought. Evidently, May of 1940, England gave the United States radar which was something entirely new. Nobody, very few people knew what it does. <coughs> radar was a, a signal that would be pushed out in the air up to 120 miles or 140 miles, and it would hit them, um, an object, it would be bounce back to a scope that you could read and see where it was. So England gave it to us, so we, Percent over, percent over to uh, Hawaii. I always wanted to go. You know, I figured that was a cheap way of getting over there, joining the army. Well, we got over there. We took our basic training. In the middle of uh, January or February, we got our first radar unit, and by trial and error, we finally got it working. December 7th, no, December 6th, I was relieved by my friend Joe McDonald at the, uh, what we call the Information Center. There's where we used to collect any radar information we get. We put it on a table and we check it. We'd have, check it out to see if it was an enemy or a perfect or uh, uh, one of our planes. About 640 or something like that. The one radar unit, which was out on the northern shore, the man was practicing. Because we had closed down that day for one reason. A week before that, we couldn't find the Japanese Navy. And we finally, we gave it up as finding, I guess they're not out there. Little did we know that they were, went to the north, and eventually they eventually came back towards Honolulu. So the fellow that was practicing turned was working with a radar, seeing a big cloud of thing, something on the radar scope. Because you don't you don't know what it is. All you do is you see it, something moving. So he called into the information center where I worked, and he said he wanted to tell, ask the lieutenant who was on duty what he should do. So this was a young man. He was a first lieutenant, second lieutenant, just in the army, or the air force rather. And he, in turn, said to him, "Forget about it. Nothing's coming." So he says, "Okay." So then later on, about 20 minutes later, another man who looked worked with the radar called him this again and said to the man, "There's a big something's coming." He says, we don't know what it is. So they went back to the lieutenant again, and this time the lieutenant said, forget about it, don't worry about it. Well, within about a half an hour after that, the Japanese planes start bombing Pearl Harbor. Now they had, men were trained so well, they could fly low enough not to, not to get caught by the bombs, but the bombs could hit them with their targets. And I and the, my, the fellow that relieved me came to the tent. He was telling me about the radar. He said, hey, the Shem, the Japs are coming. I said, yeah, 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 you know. So we got up, and all of a sudden we heard boom, boom, boom. And when we went over to the, we were pretty high on the hill. And when they looked out, it's just like looking out at you people now. We could see planes diving. But then we wouldn't see anything, then all of a sudden we see a big cloud of smoke that the bombs had hit their target. So that was that was the beginning of Pearl Harbor. 
December 7th. It, it took us quite a while for it to perfect the way we wanted. Then later on, we, we found out we could make signal underneath it, the bib, to show that you, it was, wh whose plane it was. Every, we'd change it every day or every other day or even half a day. We would send it. When the radar was showing the blip, which went up and down, up and down, underneath, if it came down, it come down by every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds. We would set it to that. Now, if another plane would, we would see with the blips, if that came down every five minutes, every seven minutes, every 12 minutes, we knew it wasn't one of our planes. So that's how radar perfected the IFF to tell them what the plane was. After that, we, the December 7th, after it was, uh, we uh, worked on the information center where all the big shots came. I had Admiral Kimmel there, General Short, the Lieutenant Colonels all over the place. And they, they worked the whole night through, or the day through rather, and the night. And well, then we had to have the cleanup. I personally went with a lieutenant one time, and we we had to go out down to the, the, the shore where the, the ships were, and there was a uh, a submarine, one of those two main submarines from Japanese, and had been pushed ashore, but they hadn't opened it up yet. They were still in because early that morning, unbeknownst to nobody except a few that a submarine was sunk outside the harbor and the Navy didn't know anything about it. In other words, there was a lack of communications. So that, 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 that's the whole story about, about Pearl Harbor. I mean, it was something that came in fast and went out fast, but they did their job and they, they were going to come back again, which I think we might have been a little more prepared, but we, they had already done their damage. The biggest thing they forgot, they forgot to hit the oil dumps. Because if they would have hit the oil dumps, they would have really set us back. Because we did have other ships coming in. Now, some people say, the one lieutenant said, well, when, the, when they were identifying them, he said, we have ships coming in from the States, right? There was a flight of planes coming in from San Francisco. Now, those planes coming in from San Francisco were coming from the west. The planes he was picking up coming from the east. They were coming from the east, and uh, they, we, we, would, uh, we should have realized that they were Japanese planes, but they weren't. They were the... I mean, the Japanese planes were coming in, but the ones from the States never got there in time. They got there while the bombing was going on. You've probably seen movies about them already, how they, how they have a land, land like that. But other than that, after that, one of my jobs is I, I went around to a different islands and tried to help them set up the radar or the information centers. And uh, we, have, we, were, we were sent to one was called Canton Island. That was the down the Central Pacific. It was shaped like a horseshoe, 24 miles around, and uh, there's only one thing wrong with it. It was loaded with rats. You couldn't sit in your bunk and eat anything during the day. At nighttime, rats would be all over the place. I mean, and uh, I know they came over and bombed us three times over there, and every time they came over and bombed us, they hit a ship that had been shipwrecked there maybe 15 years ago, right before the war, and they never got it off the, the reef. And they, every the next day, the Tokyo Rose would say that they sank another ship. <laughs> yeah, they were hitting the same ship all the time. But that was all publicity. And, uh, that was it. I mean, to me, we did a job we had a job to do, we did our job, and we did our duty. I mean, as for the radar, it worked fine. 
uh, but there, there was lack of communications between the, uh, we weren't expecting it, you know. So is there any questions? Yeah. No, I, I traveled a little bit. I had to stop to go down the South Pacific and help put up radar units. And uh, one of my jobs is help them put the radar. Then I had to have communications. You have to have the people, when the radar picks up the planes, till they send it in. Then we have a big table with a map. You've probably seen it already on television. These big tables where they put those things out in blips. Well, that was my job to sit there and identify it. Now, I, I was only a corporal or a sergeant, so I couldn't do anything. But once, once we saw that, and if I could identify it on my sheet, we either had to, I had to ask the Navy man on one side and the Air Force man on the other side if they would identify it, all right? And if they couldn't identify it, then we knew it was, wasn't one of our planes and we have to have somebody go out and get it.